So uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, webinar, Five Steps to Better Software Asset Management. Uh, we are a few minutes uh, past the hour, so uh, we will get started. Uh, my name is Johan Sandberg, and I will be joined shortly by Dean Bates, who will be uh, presenting during this uh, webinar. And the duration should be around about 30 minutes, uh, so just for your preparation. I want to mention too that your microphones are not working, but that you can uh, submit questions during the session, and we will answer as many as we can at the end. And if there is some questions that we will not get to, we will send out emails uh, afterwards. Um, so before we start, I would like to say a few words to introduce Vector Networks and uh, where we come from. So uh, first, Vector has over 20 years of experience in developing IT management products. Um, so the webinar today is general about the five steps, as we said, but we will show some examples from our flagship advisor suite, uh, where software license management is one module, uh, together with asset management and service desk. We also have the PC Duo, uh, which is an enterprise remote control tool. Uh, so over the years, some of these uh, customers, these are our references. Uh, you will probably recognize them as a mix of private and public organizations uh, across the United States, uh, but we're also present in Canada uh, and in Europe. Uh, and for the final slide, and before we get started, uh, we are very proud to have received various awards, including this one from the Infotech Group. Uh, typically, Vector, we, we score high uh, in terms of innovation and comprehensive product features. So that was a very brief uh, overview about Vector Networks. I know you all came for the presentation. So I will now hand over to Dean Bates to start this presentation. And I will be back at the end of this for the Q&A session. So enjoy the uh, webinar, everyone. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so without further ado, then our sort of first step to um, better software asset management is um, having a central repository. And by that we mean a central repository for all of your entitlements. And a repository could be as simple as a spreadsheet. Um, in fact, a lot of our customers um, come to us when they've outgrown a spreadsheet. Um, but it's important that the repository is a central place of truth. Um, it's surprising how many people we speak with and they have multiple repositories for the different um, software which they're using. Um, their enterprise agreements are maybe in the Microsoft portal, um, they've got a solution for managing cloud applications, they're managing uh, mobile apps in an enterprise um, device um, 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 application. Um, but really having everything all together in one place and that central place of truth makes it much easier for managing things like renewals. Um, and it also gives an opportunity to involve the entire organization in the uh, software asset management process. Um, so as we said, a repository really could be anything from a spreadsheet um, um, up to a, a sort of full um, software asset management solution. Um, but what I wanted to do is just show you um, what that central repository looks like in um, our tool, in the Visor tool. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just go over into the Visor tool. And uh, firstly, you'll notice that the Visor is a web application, so it's highly distributable, uh, which means it's very easy for people to get access into the system. And you'll notice that we have these uh, demo users um, down the bottom. These aren't there in production, they're just there for demo. Um, but what they do represent is the different users who can access the system. So obviously a software asset manager, um, you may want an IT manager again um, to have a view of all of your purchasing and all of your licenses and entitlements. Um, you may provide the help desk team with a different view of the data which is appropriate to uh, um, them servicing um, people within your organization. Uh, moving outside of IT, then there could be roles um, for um, HR, for example, and even the end users themselves. Um, one of the uh, pieces of functionality we have in the Visor system is a enterprise app store where uh, um, end users can go and request applications and they go through approval and we manage the um, provisioning process of those applications. Um, so what I'm going to do is just go in as a software asset manager 
And each of those users gets a home page or a dashboard which is appropriate um, to their particular role um, with regards to software asset management. And these are widgets or KPIs which we see here. They can be customized based on um, the user's um, current role or maybe a project they're working on. So for example, if someone's managing uh, a Microsoft re review or renewal, and then they could have KPIs which were appropriate to um, that particular project. Um, well, the um, KPIs are drilled down, so um, here we can see that there's two licenses which are about to expire, and we could drill down and see details of uh, those particular licenses. As well as having the information presented on the home pages, then the system is proactive and will send email notifications about events. So not only renewals, but um, true ups or reviews, um, and also other actions around software asset management. So if somebody makes a request, um, then that request could be approved um, within the system. So it's very proactive on um, sort of um, making that central repository kind of come to you. So for those wishing to compare the entitlements in the repository with what's deployed, um, normalization is an important next step. Um, to find out what's deployed, then organizations typically use a discovery and an inventory tool. Um, so Vector has um, such a capability um, in Visor where we will find all of the PCs on your network and perform a detailed hardware and software inventory of um, those PCs. Visor also works with um, other um, tools um, which do a network discovery and inventory, um, such as Microsoft SCCM, um, for example, which um, um, will, will do an equally good job of finding what's installed on your network and uh, is installed in sort of many organizations, so we utilize that um, as well. And the problem with um, discovery tools and inventory tools is that they can uh, um, produce an awful lot of data, and we tend to call that raw data. Um, so it's literally everything which is deployed um, within your organization. So uh, and that includes all the applications which you're interested in, um, but also um, things like patches um, and updates, um, which can be sort of noise when you're dealing with uh, software asset management. So the normalization um, process helps to eliminate um, all of that noise. Um, it can also be useful in version consolidation. Um, so for example, if you wanted to manage uh, maybe which users were using the Chrome browser, then Chrome browser has over 50 versions. You might want to consolidate them down into a single version, a single entity um, which you can manage. Um, normalization also supports um, the ability of a downgrade rights. So if you have an agreement for uh, um, Office 2016 and that agreement entitles you to 2013 and 2010, um, then the normalization process can help um, sort of normalize all of those um, particular deployments. So within the Visor system, then we present a normalized list of um, software applications first and foremost. So if I go to software licenses, then what we're presented with is that normalized list. So it hasn't got any of those updates or any of that additional noise um, which will come from the discovery. This list can actually be further filtered um, if you wish. So if you wanted to see all Adobe licenses or maybe licenses which are falling out of compliance um, or um, all the licenses which were purchased this year, um, then you can sort of filter this down, this down even more. But what it does do straight away is sort of um, give you um, the applications which you're interested in um, without the noise. Now, if you want that detailed information from the um, discovery, then that's available just under here under software installations. So I can click on that. And this gives us access to all of the data which has been gathered on the network. So for example, if I wanted to find all of the software which is installed on a particular PC, then I can just search for that PC and I can see all the various applications which are on that PC and when the application was installed, um, for example, and all of the version information um, about that application. Likewise, if um, Java updates were important to me and I wanted to manage those from uh, software asset management processes, then I could import those Java updates. So we can see all of those there. And it's just one click to pull those into the Visor system. Um, so from that network discovery. 
Um, having a proof of purchase is an important step, um, particularly in audit scenarios. Um, it's kind of great having a list of your entitlements in a spreadsheet or in a system like Visor. But when vendors come to you um, in an audit scenario, then you need a, to have some proof of purchase, so the, the documentation, um, which proves that you've made a legitimate purchase. Um, there is some sort of useful advantages to having all of the purchasing and financial information um, within a software asset management tool. Um, it gives you a clear view of the um, total cost of ownership for your applications. So across all expenditure, whether it was licenses or maintenance agreements. Having all of the purchasing information also helps um, to spot um, trends um, where um, purchasing is occurring and um, you can forecast future um, software costs. So within Visor, if I uh, return to our uh, list of normalized applications and select the Microsoft Office, then we have all the details um, regarding our Microsoft Office um, um, license within the Visor system. And we see here that we have 32 licenses. And this is made up of a number of purchases. So if I go to the Purchase tab, and we can see a license purchase here of uh, 24, and another purchase of 5, another purchase here of 8. Um, you can see that purchases can become inactive, because maybe they're only valid for a certain period of time. Um, so they can become inactive, and then they're deducted from the total license count. You'll also notice that it's not just license information, there's also um, maintenance um, details in here and details of any agreements as well. And I can click on any of these agreements and see um, further information, maybe the invoice number or PO number or cost center, which is related to um, that particular um, purchase. If you want, you can add your own fields into the Visor system as well. So if there's any data which we aren't, um, don't have a field for, then it's very easy to add your own um, additional fields. As you can see here, it gives us our total cost. So for this particular application, it's around $6,500, uh, 4500 in license costs and uh, uh, nearly uh, 2000 in maintenance costs. We break down those costs by unit, and a unit is essentially uh, either an end user or a computer, so depending on the application um, type. So here we can see the average cost um, is about $180. Um, I mentioned having all of the purchasing um, proof of purchase documentation in one place is, um, is important. Um, and again, particularly in an audit scenario, so we allow you to upload any contracts or invoices, um, and scans of license certificates directly into the Visor system. And this can be sort of um, really useful should you be audited rather than searching through email inboxes and file shares and you have that proof of purchase um, documentation right next to your digital entitlement. Um, so it, it makes it much easier to obviously find that documentation. So with all that purchase information in place, then we can provide some reporting under our analytics tab where we can see our total costs over time. Um, so for the last four years, from uh, 2012 um, up to last year, with our, um, and this is showing maintenance costs and new license purchases. And this line here is showing our entitlement kind of steadily increasing over those four years. With all of that historical information, we can provide forecasting information as well. So, just go to the forecast tab. We can see in April next year, um, there's um, some forecasting uh, um, costs, maybe when a, a, a maintenance agreement expires, um, for example. So, all of the purchasing data in here can be entered directly into the Visor system. But we also integrate with existing purchasing systems you might have and invoicing systems. So for example, uh, if you're using Microsoft Dynamics and your software purchases um, go through that system in terms of invoicing, then we, you don't need to duplicate entry of that. Then we'll integrate with that system and pull um, that data into, um, into the Visor system. Okay, it wouldn't be a software um, asset management um, presentation without talking about compliance. 
obviously compliance is quite a, a sort of broad um, um, subject and uh, um, it could be a presentation in its own right. We're going to keep it to the basics um, for this presentation with regards to understanding um, various different compliance models which are required for each application. Um, having a, a clear view of your uh, effective license position, so whether you're compliant or over compliant um, and what, where you stand. Um, and over compliance is sort of particularly important, it's obviously um, a sort of huge problem if you haven't got enough licenses, but equally if you've purchased licenses and they're not being utilised, then you need to flag that up uh, as well. And uh, the various associated costs with being um, either not compliant or um, being over compliant. Within um, Visor, then previously we saw that we purchased 32 um, uh, licenses. Under the Installations tab, we can see um, what we have installed. So we can see all the computers which have um, Microsoft Office um, installed or components thereof. So you'll notice here we can see Word, and if I scroll down, I'll see um, Publisher and Excel. And we can see all of the PCs which have the various um, components installed and when those components were installed um, onto the, um, that particular device. So through um, our discovery, um, we found that there's 31 installations and there's one, um, that leaves us with one license available because um, we purchased 32. And so it's telling us that the cost of available installations is around $200. Now to determine the compliance then, um, there's obviously various different comp compliance models and Visor supports those. Um, so it could be that one license is one named user or one installation. Um, the license could be a CPU or a CPU core. Um, so for example, um, Windows Server 2016 is based on CPU cores, so you can um, do the compliance model based on um, cores. And because we've got all that inventory data, either from our own discovery or from SCCM, then we know how many cores are on each of the device, so we can determine um, um, how many cores are being used. Here we can see uh, over compliance and over compliance is where the system will flag, you, flag to you, you have more licenses than you need and having 10% more licenses than you need is probably um, maybe too high, um, but it might be an okay threshold to have maybe 2% more licenses than you actually need, um, just so you've got some in reserve. And what the system will do here is it will send you a notification if you're over that 2% and um, it will mark um, in the reports as being over um, compliant. Obviously we'll send you notifications if you don't have enough licenses as well, um, but this just tells you where you've got more licenses than you actually um, need. So to get a view of um, your effective license position then there's a number of reports um, which can do that. And the report can be filtered, so if you wanted to um, see a license position just for a particular publisher, then you could, um, for Adobe, um, for example. Here it's showing the overall uh, license position, so in this case we're so mostly compliant in green. The blue is representing where we're over compliant, so we've got more licenses than we need, and the red is where we're non-compliant, so um, there's an issue there. So looking at Microsoft Office uh, 2016, We've um, purchased um, five, that's our entitlement, and we have nine installed um, from the discovery data, um, which means we have a license surplus of minus four, so we're non-compliant, and the report's telling us that it will cost $552 um, to become compliant. And I guess the inverse of that is uh, Windows 10, where we've purchased 30, we have two installed, so we have a license surplus of 28, and it's telling us that we've got $5,000 worth of licenses we aren't using. And perhaps we aren't using those licenses because we're in the midst of a rollout, um, but there could be something um, to investigate there. Okay, so the final um, step in um, sort of better software asset management is uh, to involve HR processes in um, your sort of software asset management provision. Um, it's worth investigating um, what um, HR processes such as um, joiners, movers and leavers um, and what effects they have on your SAM procedures. 
So, for example, when somebody leaves the organization, is there an opportunity there for software license um, recycling, returning that license back into the pool so it can be used by somebody else? Um, another HR procedure um, involves role-based provisioning. So rather than deploying, for example, Microsoft uh, Office um, 365, um, the exact same version, like enterprise version, to all users, then you may want to deploy a different version to um, particular users. So maybe a kiosk mode version would be fine for some users, for example. So role-based provisioning, provisioning software based on what people actually need is, a, is sort of an important aspect. And there's a side effect of that with regards to security and benefits, um, removing access to particular applications and systems when people leave. So, so how is this shown um, within the visor system? In fact, there's a couple of places where um, we can see um, where uh, application is allocated um, to an individual. Firstly, within the application itself. So here we have Microsoft Office, and if we go to the allocation tab, we can see which users um, this application has um, been provisioned for. We also have an employee's view. So if I return to um, the home page, and this view is sometimes made available to department managers. So a department manager can log into the visor system and see all of their employees within the department and what applications um, those employees are using. So if I select uh, this employee here, then we can see all of the applications which have been allocated to um, this particular employee, Daniel. So we can see um, AutoCAD and um, um, Adobe and Office 365, where it has this um, egg timer symbol. It means that the application has been requested and approved, but the provisioning process hasn't completed. So uh, um, that's why it doesn't appear with a tick, as we see with some of the other um, resources. Now, this is a, an opportunity where role-based provisioning can come in. So, for example, if Daniel was going to work on a um, project for a short period of time, for example, an ISO project, then we could assign that project to Daniel, and the visor system will make recommendations of what software Daniel needs to work on that project. So now if I return to um, the assets list, then we can see that the system is um, making a recommendation that Microsoft Visio and Microsoft Project are needed um, because Daniel's on the ISO project. So what the Pfizer system will do is get the necessary approvals um, from maybe Daniel's line manager, maybe the resource owner or the project owner. There can be multi-layers of approval. Once it's been approved, then it will check that there's enough licenses available. And if there isn't, then it will um, send emails to necessary people um, to um, acquire those licenses. And we can also do integrations with um, SCCM to um, deploy the application. Um, or alternatively, create tickets in an existing help desk system so that it can be deployed um, using the existing help desk mechanisms. One of the great things about this is when Daniel finishes on that project, then that can simply be removed. And removing that project removes any applications which were required just for that project. So Daniel doesn't inherit um, sort of, um, access to applications um, all the time um, as he moves from project to project, and they get revoked from him. And that means that licenses can be returned back into the pool um, so they can be reused by other employees. And we can also configure processes to ensure that the application is removed, either automatically through Active Directory or SCCM, or by creating another um, help desk ticket. The same um, principle of role-based provisioning can occur when new employees start. So within the visor system, um, we can integrate with existing HR systems, or employees can actually be onboarded into visor itself. And when you onboard an employee, you tell the system what role that employee is going to have within the organization. So for example, if someone's going to be a receptionist, then Visor will make recommendations of what software receptionist needs, get the necessary approvals, check that there's enough licenses available, and then manage the deployment of that application. 
Likewise, employees can be terminated um, within the visor system and terminating the employees um, returns those licenses back into the pool and um, sets up the necessary procedures to ensure that they don't have access um, to uh, that application. If you'd like to try the visor system yourself, then we set up a um, special tiny URL um, just um, um, for this webinar. So if you go to tinyurl.com slash visor demo, then you'll be able to, uh, um, it's a sort of virtual lab where you can go in and try Visor yourself, um, create an account and uh, play around with all the functionality you've seen today. Um, there's also more information on our website and on our blog. Um, if you're not following us on Twitter, then um, I recommend you do that. Um, we're hoping to have some more of these webinars in the future and there'll be lots of information um, available on Twitter. And um, there's also um, our email addresses there, so please feel free to contact us uh, um, should you need sort of any more information. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Johan. All right, so uh, thanks very much, Dean. Uh, we have about a minute or two left, so I'll just take uh, three questions uh, that came in um, quickly. Uh, is there a way to test Visor? And that is something that, Dean, you just answered already. Um, so uh, we have answered that question. Uh, next, is Visor installed in the cloud or on-premise from Mike? Uh, actually, this works in both ways. 95% uh, of our customers install on-premise, but you can also have vector hosting this for you. And the final question from Barbara. Uh, what is the licensing model of Visor? So Visor is licensed uh, by IT and user meaning anyone uh, in the organization who would be using software. And typically, this is the same number as the number of employees. And technically, it would be most often account from Active Directory. Um, so we're up at the half hour mark. Uh, so that would be all the questions we have time for in this session. Uh, but we will reach out to any of you who have uh, answer, asked any questions. And uh, with that, we hope you enjoyed today's uh, webinar and got some useful info out of it. Feel free, as uh, Dean mentioned, to contact us for any comments, uh, questions, or suggestions. But now, on behalf of Vector Networks, uh, thank you for your interest and uh, wishing you all a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you.